My name is Kia Miner. I'm editor-in-chief of BridesandBrides.com. I went to high school in Massachusetts and to University of Massachusetts for college and then to Howard University in DC for law school. I started off as a communications major in college. It should have been a sign that I wanted to do something in media, but somewhere along the lines I got it in my head that I wanted to be a lawyer. I look back and I'm like, was it Allie McBeal? I don't really remember why, but I decided that I wanted to practice corporate law, so then went on to law school. I liked the idea of having a law degree and what you could do with that. You could go into business, um, but the reverse wasn't necessarily true. And I think I liked the suit and the office and the check looking back. But I also um, liked the idea of working with small companies, which was really exciting during the dot-com years. And then not so much after the bubble burst. <laughs> I practiced corporate law for a total of four years, but about around year two, I realized this is not for me. I was working actually with really wonderful people, and I knew like the fact that I was working with great people and was still miserable meant that it was not gonna get any better than it was at the time. I realized early on that I was never gonna be great at it because I didn't care that much. I believe that to be great at something, you have to wanna eat you know, breathe it and sleep it and read about it in your spare time and go to events after work and all that stuff. And I had no interest in SEC bulletins and that kind of thing. <laughs> I realized, okay, I've got to figure out a plan B. I looked for anything else that I could do with a law degree that wouldn't require such a pay cut, especially in New York. The exact words were go for broke and do what I really am passionate about. And for me, that was publishing. Publishing represented the idea of, of, of writing for a living. I was on Law Journal in, at Howard, so there were signs all along the way. My mother has reminded me that um, I actually had a pen name as a child. I'm not gonna say what it was, but it was the combination of two general hospital characters. And I would write stories and, um, under this name. And then I started to take classes to really make sure that I, that I definitely wanted to do this, and I just absolutely loved it. Like once I decided that I was gonna go into magazines, there was no second guessing it. I had decided that I was going to save a year's worth of mortgage payments, and then I was just gonna quit regardless, and flooded the industry with my resume. People would not hire me. They didn't believe that I would work as an assistant after having had an assistant. There was a startup magazine called Travel Savvy, and they had a position open for a lifestyle intern. I literally sent them my resume three ways and the owner finally called me and he was like, come in already. We have no idea why you wanna work here, but just come in. I hit it off with him and that's how I started. Making this shift from being an attorney to being a lifestyle intern for me was fantastic. It wouldn't have worked for everyone. It was great because I probably spent the last year of my legal career like being on the subway and looking at people who wore jeans to work and graphic designers who had backpacks and portfolios and were artists and thinking like, where are you going? I want to go there. I was really focused on the fact that I was doing exactly what I wanted to do. So I think any of the feelings of like, okay, I'm reporting to someone who's 10 years younger than me or these people are kids, I didn't have that feeling because I was so excited to be on the right track. The way that I was able to move from being a lifestyle intern to editor-in-chief in two years, this is something that would only happen at a small startup. In most shops, I wouldn't have had that much hands-on experience um, being so junior on the staff. But because it was a startup, we didn't have a lot of money. If anyone wanted to pitch in for anything, like you know, all hands on deck, everyone was welcome. Having practiced corporate law and worked with a lot of small companies, you know, I really understood a lot of the dynamics of, of running a small business. And I think that that helped me show leadership skills in that environment and, and helped for me to move up the ranks. I was editor-in-chief of Travel Savvy when an opportunity came up to work at Niche Media. And I knew that I really wanted to move into the luxury lifestyle space. There was an opportunity to be managing editor of two of their magazines. And I thought, well, for sure, it's based in New York. It's gotta be Gotham and Hamptons. And I went in for the interview and it was Aspen Peak and LA Confidential. And I was like, huh, okay. But it was still doing it from New York. And so I started on my first day and I was like, okay, so excited to meet my boss. They hadn't hired that person. Aspen Peak was twice a year, so that wasn't as much um, of a challenge. LA Confidential, on the other hand, was closing, meaning going to press three weeks later. We didn't have a cover and I didn't have a boss. 
So I basically started running that book. Then an opportunity came to become Editor-in-Chief of Gotham, which was the flagship publication, and I was promoted to Editor-in-Chief of Gotham. And people always ask me, like, was that a huge transition from LA Confidential to Gotham? And I was like, oh, I pretty much changed my voicemail and went back to work. Friends of mine had started Uptown and really wanted to create a luxury lifestyle magazine that was geared towards professional African Americans. And I thought, well, here's an opportunity to work on a magazine that was going to defy stereotypes and, um, and really help create something. And so I had spoken to them from time to time and I really wasn't ready to leave Gotham. I wasn't ready to leave Gotham when I finally did, but Uptown had received major financing and it was a moment where they were really going to expand and to be able to help build something was really exciting. So that's when I joined Uptown. People ask me all the time about how did you get into bridal coming from luxury lifestyle. But when you think about it, there's a lot of overlapping subject matter. All of my career, I've sort of focused on the extras and the things that make life fun. And really when you think about bridal, this is a woman wanting to be her best and throw the best party of her life, whether it is the best in fashion or the best in cuisine or arts and culture, cake and flowers and dinner parties, things that I had covered before but now covering it in a way that really makes this the ultimate opportunity when it comes to women's magazines. When the opportunity came up to be editor-in-chief or when they were looking to fill the position, I jumped at the opportunity. It's not like I was like plucked randomly just walking down the street and someone was like, oh you, you be editor-in-chief. No, I mean I threw actively threw my hat in the ring. I think Anyone who really wants a job should do that. I think women definitely should do that too. I've talked to some of my friends who a lot of people sort of sit back and wait for someone to realize that they're doing a great job and hope that they will just miraculously get rewarded for that. When I go to like women's leadership workshops, one of the things that we often talk about is how men will speak up and say, I would be great in this position, whereas women often sit back and wait for people to recognize that they would be great for this position. Luckily, working at Condé Nast, I work with a lot of women who lean in. It's an environment where I definitely was encouraged to speak up and say, like, I really want this opportunity. To be the first African-American editor-in-chief at Condé Nast was exciting from the perspective. I think to be the first of anything is sort of a mark, of a notch on your belt, you could say, um, something to be proud of. But really, to be editor-in-chief at Condé Nast, that's exciting for anyone. There are 18. There are 18 editor-in-chiefs of consumer publications here, so to be one of those 18 is fantastic. To be the first black person to do it, I think the, the best part of that, or certainly the surprising part that was really wonderful, is how much support I got. When I became editor-in-chief, it's funny actually because some of my father's friends really teased him because he probably had the hardest time with me leaving law to um, make no money and go into publish things. So one of his good friends actually called him. He said, I, I guess it's okay that Kia left law now. You think you're okay with it now? So um, yes, my parents were very proud. For all aspects of the brand that I manage, I have to say my favorite part is still the magazine, the, the print part of my responsibilities. We start working on an issue about six months before that issue goes to press. We have planning meetings and then from there it's sort of a weekly labor of love that gets more intense as we get closer to the deadline. We've got about 30 people, I think it's 32 right now, who work on the magazine and um, you know, someone said to me, it's white dresses all the time, what's the difference? And I was like, you know, no, there are seven shades of white this season, actually. There are trends and the business is constantly changing. And with that, we also know that there are so many choices out there for brides that like they could drive themselves crazy if they are going to look at every single invitation and every single party favor idea. And so we, what we want to do is curate and bring the best of that stuff to them in the magazine. Everyone on the staff is working towards that goal and everyone on the staff is very passionate so we can have great debates over, you know, tool for this story, no, silk, satin, you know, those things can become very serious, um, passionate conversations. Something that we constantly remind ourselves about here more so than any other publication where I've worked is that we are really influencing people, really influencing women at a real emotional time in their life and 
I have people who sometimes come up to me or in a, I'm meeting them in business and they think, I've read Bride since I was a little girl or I knew the minute that I got engaged that I was going to run to the newsstand and pick up Bride's because you know, my mother picked it up. They just had this idea and they have this emotional attachment to the magazine. So we do think about what we're putting in the pages because we know it's reaching so many people and it's reaching them at a time when they're going through this amazing transition, this really exciting transition in their life. Working at Condé Nast where I'm surrounded by all these power women, all these women who are juggling both their personal and professional life and are really passionate about what they do and are really professional rock stars. It's an amazing place to work for that reason. That's one of many reasons, but yes. I can honestly say I love coming to work every day. Having spent four years doing something where I would wake up on Monday and think, four days till the weekend, to absolutely loving coming to work every day um, is an amazing feeling. It's something that I don't take for granted. I'm very lucky in terms of I have a wonderful team. I have a really funny team, um, which makes even the days that could be a little hectic still enjoyable because we laugh a lot. And it's also, it's bridal. And this is the happiest, like this is probably the happiest floor in Midtown. It's not just about the party as much as I love to talk about the party. This is really an amazing moment in a woman's life. And I don't think it's cheesy to be excited about your wedding. And being excited about being married doesn't make you, you know, a 1950s housewife. It means, means that you are excited as a woman to move on to this next chapter. And it can be a really empowering time. It's exciting to be able to come to work and think about, okay, how are you gonna to speak to all these women who are going through it? And how are you also gonna carry on the, the brand and build on the legacy? How many people get to run a brand that's almost 80 years old? That's incredible. It's fantastic.